I think that when Brooke heard that I was a student of Peter Wells, that she might have assumed that I work in the Iron Age or later, uh, not realizing perhaps that my topic today lies five or six millennia before the other papers in this session, uh, these being the earliest farming societies of Central Europe in the second half of the sixth millennium BC. Now, 40 years ago, uh, the communities of the linear, linear pottery culture and its offspring uh, were the domain of a handful of specialists. A uh, uh, child uh, called them the Danubians. Um, today, they're widely appreciated in the European archaeological literature for what they tell us about the dispersal of agri- uh, uh, whoop. Yeah, 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 but, uh, Keep people awake, you know, otherwise they'll fall asleep. Uh, uh, of agricultural dispersals in temperate forests and an array of other topics greatly facilitated by marvelous advances in dating, ancient DNA, residue analysis, isotopic studies, and a tsunami of data from new excavations. Uh, the current state of knowledge enables us to think broadly about these societies and to imagine them as more complicated and interesting uh, than just hard scrabble cultivators living in longhouses, herding cattle, steadily expanding across Central Europe until they reach the limits of the fertile loose soil. In reality, they had sophisticated food production and animal management systems that superbly facilitated their dispersal and persistence. Recent debates, for example, about their settlement layouts have enriched scholarly discourse. Uh, researchers have again taken up the topic of mobility and its social consequences, and my paper is a modest contribution to that discussion. We can't escape the profound geographical dimension to their social arrangements, uh, and we're now acutely aware of the time depth to their story of these uh, linear pottery farmers. Uh, these dimensions often get flattened out. Uh, the dispersal of linear pottery across Europe is often portrayed as a spreading blob uh, of, uh, that seems to saturate all of uh, Central Europe. And until the advent of high-resolution radiocarbon dating, uh, it was very common to say that uh, this spread of this blob took place uh, within the blink of an eye in archaeological time 7,000 years ago. We've actually known for some time this is not entirely accurate. Central Europe was not as saturated with linear pottery settlements as the standard map suggests. Uh, settlement cells were concentrated in Lus basins and in several what you might call exclaves on the North European plain, in uh, northern Poland, for example. The process of dispersal and infilling took place over nearly five centuries, in which you might find 20, maybe even 30 generations. The initial dispersal of linear pottery farmers did not conform to a stochastic wave, as we often find in the older uh, literature, in which the aggregate distance of individual moves formed what you might call a normal distribution, uh, uh, steadily advancing across uh, uh, over the distance uh, across Central Europe. Rather, it seems to have been a more complex process, in which a small number of long-distance colonization events, uh, what you see here on the, on the right, uh, depicted, uh, were complemented by many short distance, uh, short distance moves, perhaps reflecting a different tolerance for risk, uh, for example. Um, these long distance events established the initial perimeters of the linear pottery diaspora, which then moved forward to the edge of the Lus and beyond. I think the word perimeter is more apt than frontier to describe this notional line between farming settlement and the world beyond in Central Europe. All of the Danubian world of Central Europe was effectively a deep and wide uh, frontier zone. Settlement cells were separated by interior borderlands and perhaps contested no man's lands. I apologize for the gendered language uh, here. Perhaps we can, in the spirit of this session, we can Latinize it to terra nullius uh, over multiple generations uh, uh, here. Uh, we might even see these as um, interstitial frontiers, uh, much like those described by uh, Igor Kopitov in eth African ethnography, uh, where effectively unassigned space, space is over time uh, uh, defined uh, socially and politically uh, in the interstices between the main uh, settlement, uh, uh, settlement zones. So, uh, so rather than focusing on simply on this perimeter, first this one and then, and then later that one, this whole region is essentially effectively a frontier zone of human movement, interaction, and the processes that I'll talk about uh, in, this, uh, in this paper. Uh, in, in many respects, the, on, on this 1938 map of Werner Butler, 
Uh, actually, the, pe the, pets, the discontinuous nature of linear pottery settlement, uh, as it was known at the time, um, uh, uh, better than the, the blob map, which uh, is reproduced so, uh, so widely. It's just simply too hard to recreate all these dots uh, today and expand the coverage to areas where sites are only now being uh, discovered in great numbers in the uh, uh, north and, uh, wet and eastern and western uh, edge of, uh, of linear pottery. Linear pottery dispersal might be better represented met metaphorically by the spread of a wildfire, uh, as seen last month most vividly in California. After an, an initial combustion event, burning embers fall from the sky and start multiple fire cells at some distance from the source event. Each of these first generation fires then spreads locally um, and casts forth more airborne, or airborne member, embers uh, and so forth until the fire expands along uh, its axis of proper propagation. So you have a, a clearly defined axis of propagation uh, here uh, until it gets confined uh, within a perimeter. This is not the same fire, different fire, but better perimeter. Um, at a macro regional level, uh, many fire events over the years uh, and decades eventually blanket an immense area, this being uh, central Alaska here with lots of uh, forest fires uh, in it, uh, which gives the impression of widespread coverage, uh, perhaps uh, analogous to the 20 or 30 generations of linear pottery settlement cells that blanket central Europe. The analogy is not perfect. Uh, the interior zone of the fire eventually burns itself out. Well, in the linear pottery case, the interior zone continue to be uh, populated uh, and the scene of lively social uh, interactions and, and, and movements. Um, but over time, these interstitial uh, frontiers uh, within it uh, uh, became increasingly appropriated and socially defined and uh, uh, used um, in, a, in a more specific and defined way um, over time. Settlement within the linear pottery perimeter can be seen archaeologically to have occurred in several stages along multiple axes of propagation. Slowly, I'm working the fire ter terminology into, uh, into the, uh, the idea here. Uh, these stages do not represent uh, the lived experiences of early farming communities, but simply reflect the extent of chronologically sensitive pottery styles, actually. We'll back up here. Uh, the inertial dispersal up the uh, uh, middle Danube drainage uh, from an uh, initial combustion event, shall we say, uh, in the Lake Balaton area, as Esther uh, has uh, uh, discovered the, um, uh, what appears to be the zone of the initial combustion event uh, for linear pottery, uh, then uh, uh, moved up between 5,500 and 5300 BC, followed by sub subsequent expansion to the north and west and a final extension into northern France. These broad chronological stages mask countless individual lived experiences within a complex mosaic of relocation, absorption, and reconfiguration of affiliations and identities across perhaps two dozen uh, generations or so. It's easy to, rem to romanticize these, uh, these farmers, uh, as this picture of Neolithic people uh, dressed as senior lecturers drawing water from uh, a well suggests. Um, uh, but there was also a dark side, um, as represented by mass graves at Talheim and Schindler, uh, Kilianschatten, uh, where farmers killed other farmers. Uh, strontium isotope ratios indicate that individual people moved around quite a bit, uh, although their settlements reflect commitments to uh, long-term habitation spanning multiple generations, uh, or at least through one household cycle of, of uh, uh, grandparents, parents, and, and children. Uh, although only a few households are present at, on a settlement at any one time, a lot of memories were brought to each place and were left there over multiple generations. Uh, the common graphic identity of incised pottery and longhouse architecture, what we might call today the linear pottery brand, uh, leads to an assumption of strong common identity across space and across generations. Uh, but was that really the case? Everyone had a biography that included movement or an ancestral homeland. Where are you from would have been a very reasonable question asked throughout the linear pottery frontier. Sometimes it might have been a friendly greeting, but it also could have had a bit of an edge uh, to it. So multi-generational fixed settlement, like uh, as is shown at uh, Ithra here in uh, central Germany, paradoxically promoted human movement at the individual and the household scale, creating conditions under which some members of a community chose to relocate. Uh, 
Such intense and focused sociality in multi-household, multi-generation <coughs> linear pottery settlements was rarely seen again in Central Europe for, uh, for many uh, uh, centuries, uh, even millennia, uh, where dispersed farmsteads eventually became uh, the common uh, settlement form. For the most part, interper interpersonal reactions probably were amicable, uh, but there were inevitably asymmetries between ambitions and possibilities, access to resources and mates, and other dissatisfactions with living arrangements that come from sustained face-to-face -face contact, contact. We can presume that these uh, emerged at some times in these uh, settlements. Often, some people or households probably needed to move. So if asymmetric and contentious interactions were taking place throughout the linear pottery frontier, there was probably considerable individual movement between settlements as a common occurrence. And there may also have been non-contentious interactions uh, between settlements as people simply left ancestral homes to, to join new households and seek new opportunities. Archaeogenetic and strontium isotope data from sites like Karsdorf argue for frequent interchange of individuals within a network of settlements. The important thing is that this movement was at the individual and household level, not as child or others would have envisioned a century ago, uh, the wholesale abandonment of settlements in which everyone relocated to fresh soil. But at this point, we can begin to theorize about the nature of social relations within the settlement hotspots throughout the linear pottery space, especially once the main perimeter was reached around 5300 uh, BC or thereabouts, and further movements took place largely internally within it. Uh, the axes of propagation shifted from divergence towards uncolonized zones, unassigned zones, um, as you might call it in, um, in designing a new building by an architect, um, uh, to these un to unassigned zones, to convergence towards areas of existing settlement, uh, although the motivations for relocation may have been the same. And here's where we get into further complications. Communities composed of immigrants, um, just as an example, we'll, uh, just depict the, uh, the great linear pottery site of Weichingen in Germany, uh, and their descendants experienced struggles for cultural ownership, particularly as individuals and households arrive from different origin points and in different generations. We can envision such struggles as happening within linear pottery communities. Just because they made similar pottery does not necessarily mean that they were all in solidarity. Newcomers might assert a claim to a more authentic Danubian identity, while at the same time threatening the host community's connections with its past and its founding. Some newcomers might have been transient, staying briefly before moving on. Others might have uh, stayed around for a while and become uh, seen by the established residents as uh, sore thumbs, um, uh, disrupting existing social relationship in the, in the receiving community. Existing communities, in turn, could be perceived as hostile and unwelcoming, uh, prompting the establishment of fresh settlements in the terra nullius. Along the axes of movement, tensions would, could cascade down established migration paths as people from different origins converged on settlement cells near the perimeter. For example, up in the Cuyabia region of central Poland, uh, where I've been involved in studying Neolithic sites for, uh, for 40 years, uh, linear pottery set, uh, ceramics at different sites suggest multiple points of origin for the earliest farming communities between 5300 and 5000 BC, drawn to the same area by its rich soils, forest grazing potential, and saline habitats uh, attractive to lactating uh, cows. And an illustration of how authenticity of identity can be contested in an immigrant setting comes from a very different historical context, namely something I know very well from my personal life, the history of immigration to the United States from Poland. This process had a duration of over two centuries and occurred in very definite episodes after an early trickle and then a large economic diaspora Second and subsequent generations of Polish Americans have reinterpreted their collective identity in the New World over time, while later uh, waves of immigrants brought their versions of Polish culture from the homeland, which meanwhile had become shaped by multiple historical forces that were outside the lived experiences of the earlier immigrants. An example is the tension between the descendants of Polish immigrants who arrived en masse uh, between 1880 and 1924, this is, this is not uh, an immigration uh, that you would see in, the, uh, in, in uh, Britain here, for example. Uh, the, they went directly from Poland to the, uh, to the U.S. in tremendous numbers. Um, and then those who arrived, the difference between this group and those who arrived uh, post-World War II uh, as economic refugees or, in, uh, or as political refugees um, in the uh, uh, 1960s and 1980s, um, which again, you, which you did get here in, uh, in Britain. Uh, and so there are gaps between very, very distinctly defined cohorts. Um, but they, uh, the 
point is that these individual cohorts had very, very little in common, except for this shared ancestral homeland, despite expectations of common interest. Language, dialect, music, food, other core forms of uh, cultural expression uh, have been points of disconnection and contention between these various uh, cohorts over time. Now, the purpose of this analogy is to stress that uh, frontier social processes not only have a spatial extent, but also a time depth with the passage of generations. Um, so so you know, where you're located is not just uh, physical space, but also where you are in time in the various cohorts of, uh, of uh, immigrants. If, if new arrivals encounter communities that have been in place for three or four generations, the constructed identities of the individuals born locally <coughs> almost certainly differ from the way the newcomers see themselves. While newcomers import things and practices from their homelands, locals may be certain that these do not reflect their own lived experiences, even if the two groups do share social spaces in the new, uh, in the new world. Um, at the same time, the newcomers may awaken or reawaken some sense of ancestral identity in second and third generation locals, causing them to adopt ancient things and practices that their parents had long since put aside. So my goal in this paper is to raise questions about the interplay of mobility and social relations among the early farming uh, communities of Central Europe during the second half of the sixth millennium BC. Within this vast space of riverine interior Central Europe, the movement of individuals and households not only resulted in the successful establishment of new communities, but also created conditions for social differences and tensions to be amplified uh, with the passage of generations. Just because they shared a common graphic identity, pottery with incised lines, does not mean that every community interpreted its collective identity in exactly the same way. Were these emergent social differences and conflicts eventually homogenized as later generations intermarried and old tensions faded? Or did new ones emerge as movement within the linear pottery perimeter uh, continued um, in, in the fifth millennium uh, BC? The point is we can now start to think in these terms and ask these sorts of questions with the superb data that is now becoming available from uh, uh, excavations on these sites. So thanks very much. <laughs>